if I ask you who the grandfather of photography is, if you know, absolutely well done, Sir William Henry Fox Talbot. He was born about 1800, just sometime after then, and he developed the idea or the concept of capturing images on some sort of medium. That being paper, sensitive paper. One of the first images that were ever to be captured and showcased was of a window. You can see the apertures of the window just very faintly on a piece of paper. To you and I, it may not look much compared to the iPhone quality or DSLR quality of today, but back then it was pioneering. They say that photography went even further back in time to the Greeks or even the Egyptian period. They were all having a dabble at pinpoint photography. You must have done that at school where you put a little pinpoint into a piece of card or paper, turn the lights out, hold it near a blank surface, a plain surface, and point it towards one of your windows and you will see an image upside down bear in mind but you will see an image of your window against the wall it's, it's brilliant it's a great thing to do with the kids if you don't know about it get on with it it's fantastic and you can see where the idea of photography came from now for me photography has been fundamental in my life i've done many other things but i've always come back to photography and this doing the vlogs is a form of photography now traditionally i'm a stills man i pick up my camera that i've had for crikey older than my children this is almost what 16 or nearly 20 years old one of the very first digital cameras that ever came out. i think it's about 6.4 megapixel or something like that compared to today's 20 plus but even some of the big professionals state that you don't need that many pixels and this still does the job for me i've shot hundreds of weddings and portraits and gosh knows what else on this camera the only thing that has changed about this camera is the lens i've gone through about three or four different lenses over the years but otherwise it remains the same and the reason why i like to use this because it's heavy it's beefy compared to today's modern cameras that are very very light but before that i was introduced into photography by my father who used to dabble as an amateur in photography halina this camera, I think I might have shown you this before on vlogs, 35mm camera. That's the, uh, I don't even know how to get into it, it's been that long. Oh, hey -oh. there we go. That's the uh, the film that you put in, oh, that stinks, uh, in the back of there, you wind it. Oh, I'm sure there's hundreds and thousands of you that uh, understand exactly what I mean about winding a film on to take the picture. It was all manual, you had to work it out yourself, and that was a baptism of fire for me because none of this was automatic and I just went out and I must have put hundreds hundreds of rolls of film through this and I had to learn the hard way as today it's all digital it kind of all works it out for you one of my first professional film cameras was the EOS 50E E meaning that it could sense the way your eye was looking for it to focus which was quite scary back in them days as you can see again 35 millimeter camera and these all still work they might look a bit shabby again I've done hundreds of weddings on these it's crazy to think that these were uh, the top-notch equipment of the day Now these, whether it's digital or film, are a single lens reflex camera, also known as an SLR. Well, known as an SLR back then, but now they are digital single lens reflex cameras. And what they mean by that is, it's just got a single lens that whatever you look through here, you are looking through the lens. Some older cameras and some of the cheaper cameras, say for instance, like this one, when you look through the viewfinder here, out of there it's not actually what the camera sees it's slightly offset for, for distant fit pictures it was all right but for close-ups it was uh when you got your pictures back the people tend to be just off slightly or your subject tend to be off slightly to one side which is great for fun cameras you remember them used to get them in the old uh, cigarette coupons i think that's where my parents must have got that as a holiday camera and if i remember rightly this is a one two six negative Uses Kodak 126 film. Yes, absolutely right. It's sold by Boots the Chemist at Market Street, Blackpool, Lancashire. 126 was a great format. Um, slightly a bit obscure size-wise for, for putting them in picture frames or whatever because 35mm, which has been around 
for a long, longer than you actually think. I think 35 mil goes back to the uh, World War One period. They were starting to experiment with that because it was a, um, a type of film uh, format, but then eventually came into its own with stills photography. So when you look through there, you are actually looking through the lens itself. And when you take the picture, the lens that's mounted onto here has a mirror behind it. And that mirror flicks up out the way Flicks up out of the way and exposes the film behind or now it's a it's a sensor a light sensor see so the actual concept and the principal idea of exposing your medium whatever it will be or has been has never really changed so quite a lot there to absorb just as the first part of explaining about photography but hey don't worry about it it's all fun today learning photography couldn't be easier I'd like to say it's a bit of a cheat really because a lot of the work is now done afterwards on Adobe Photoshop or similar whereas when I started photography and a lot of other people did you had to get it right the first time before you press that switch. Now I like to think that generally choosing your camera for what you need you maybe have to do a little bit of research because not all cameras will suit fit for whatever work you want to do. Today I use a mirrorless camera. Do you know when I was showing you that little mirror that pops up and down? Well, this camera that I'm using now doesn't have that anymore. Um, it doesn't have a viewfinder either. It has an LCD screen at the back. So it's just displaying the image all times from when it's absorbing the light onto the chip, projects it onto the back. The reason why I do that, I have had big DSLR cameras, digital ones for video before. They're quite big, they're quite bulky, especially if I'm gonna be traveling over to Manchester or Liverpool. I wanna carry as little as I possibly can. And I tend to find that the mirrorless cameras are great. Something else you might need if you're going to do video or you're going to do vlogging is a flip screen so you can look at yourself. Now, I'll tell you a little uh, secret. When I bought this camera, this mirrorless camera, I must have been looking at the wrong image when I was doing a review because the ones I was looking at, it had a flip screen. When this arrived, it didn't have a flip screen. And I thought, oh, I've been sold wrong. It wasn't. I got it completely wrong. <laughs> I actually bought the wrong camera. But I thought, hey, I'll give it a go anyway. And now, to be honest with you, I've got used to not looking at myself in the screen because I found in the past when there has been a screen, I'm looking to the left of the screen of the camera lens itself. I'm not actually looking at the camera. I don't want this uh, to be coming too comprehensive because I certainly don't want to confuse you. But I'm going to go over certain grounds and certain areas of photography and videography and if you need to elaborate and look into it more so, then the best place to learn is not only, of course, by buying books, but YouTube is a fantastic place to learn anything, any industry that you want to get yourself involved in. And the reason why I'm doing this vlog, I did the video one where I did a little sort of glossy over just to see what the feedback was. And uh, it was it was good feedback that come back. A lot of people said that they learned something, although to me, it's second nature. Well, believe me, I couldn't go into uh, your industry and do your work. We're all talented our own ways. But if I can share my knowledge, my experience of what now, almost 30 years that I've been taking photographs, uh, then if you can get anything out of this, then it makes me very happy indeed. But I do get people contacting me on a regular basis, asking me the base, basically the question, basically the basically the question is what camera should I buy? And I can't really, I can't really answer that for you. It, it, the cameras that I buy are for me. It's like a toolbox, like a carpenter will have his own particular tools. You get the point, don't you? Um, Richard Ellis, he did contact me, so I need your advice. I'm very interested to start to take stills photos. I'm a keen astronomer. I would love to take photos that you see of all the stars traveling around the pole star, which probably would involve a trip somewhere that stays dark for 24 hours, but would also like to get macro shots of nature with landscape shots of railways and canals and between. Can you recommend a camera that's capable of doing this? Obviously, I will need different lenses. Would love to hear what you use or would use. So please, can you help? Thanks for your content all information you pass on. It's a joy every time. So I hope to hear from you soon. Thanks, Richard. It's, uh, t you've, uh, you've gone from landscape to macro to photography on the railways to astronomy. That is such a dynamic range. Now, if you want to become a specialist, 
then you need to decide what area of photography that you want to focus on. I'm not saying you ignore the other areas, but you need to work out which one you really want to get your teeth stuck into because it is a learning curve for each different area. Portraiture and weddings, you're photographing people, but they are completely two different types of beasts, believe you me. And then you've got astro photography, which is nighttime photography, where you've got the lack of one element, light, because you're looking for the light that's coming from the heavens. And I've done astro photography, and I thoroughly enjoyed astro, and this was all done on negative. Have a look at these pictures that I've taken of the planets and the moon. I mean, these photographs are going back like 25 years when I was using my Canon 50e up there when I had a, a, a mount that went onto my telescope to these pictures. You're dealing with bodies out there that are not static. The earth is rotating. So when you use a telescope, you're magnifying the speed of that object moving across your viewfinder. So you'll need a motor drive to follow that object, but it needs to be spot on, which means you need to set it up to the pole star. Now, a lot of you are probably turning off now because you just want to know about rail photography. But what I'm saying is absolutely true. Because if you are looking for a telescope that's 20 times or 55 times, as regards, in telescope terms, you use it by times, then you are looking at an object moving, what perceives to be moving across the heavens 50 times or 55 times faster than what it does with the naked eye. So you need to take that into account. Astrophotography, it can be a difficult area to learn but once you've mastered the basics it's very easy to start transferring that to other areas of photography uh, as regards macro photography uh, well that's basically when you're getting up close and personal to the the subject that you want to photograph whether it's a, an insect or a flower or anything of, of minute detail now what you can do is when you buy a camera, you get something what's called, a, I, I call them a kit lens. I think they're still called kit lenses. That's the kit lens that comes with most cameras today. It's an 18 to 55 millimeter lens. Now the best thing about these lenses is this, that, I mean, this isn't the original lens hood when it comes off, um, but it is, there's a thread inside here that you can screw things on too. I really must clean my camera more often. And I bought rings, um, macro rings that I, turn, I've, I call them macro rings anyway. And you can attach these to the end of your camera. Uh, this one's a plus one, then there's a plus two and a plus four. And they're basically just magnifying glasses. They're basically like magnifying glasses that magnify when you want to get up and close and that's how you get away with macro photography now if you look on the kit lenses themselves it actually will say macro or sometimes it's denoted by an m 0.25 of a meter which is about eight foot which it says on there that tells you how close you can get up to your subject but if you put a plus one on or end it up to a plus four you're obviously getting that greater, you're obviously being able to get that shorter distance to your subject that you want to photograph. The best advice I can give you is just get out there and snap, 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 snap. Take hundreds and hundreds of, and never be complacent or satisfied with the photograph, the best photographs you get. Always look for room of improvement. And that's how you better yourself. Even today, I do it now. I'm so critical. Photographers are the most critical people on the planet. The, the stuff you can do now compared to then is absolutely stunning. But as you appreciate, back in them days, you had to set everything up there and then. And then you did some of the manipulation with your wet chemistry dodging and burning that'll put a, a smile on people's face yep it's on adobe photoshop now dodging and burning but when i was doing uh, photography you had like a little thin piece of wire with a little cut out piece of card attached to the end and you you were either dodging or you were burning overexposing certain areas or trying to avoid certain areas being like yeah i mean and what you see on adobe photoshop some of the stuff on there you could actually do in a lab under the red pygmy bulb uh, and trying to print your work and you didn't get it right all the time you couldn't go to your history and just go backwards you develop it and think oh and you'd have to do it all over again and you know before you know it two or three hours have passed just to get one image and you you gained a better appreciation for your work then because it was harder to get 
a good photograph to how you wanted to get that photograph. One of the greatest examples that I did uh, when I was young, I grabbed this shot. It's taken at the Ginn in Blackpool, looking towards Bower and Furness, uh, the Lake District there, a lightning bolt that came right down. I'd spent many hours on my bicycle traveling down the far coast trying to find the best spot to get a lightning shot. But this was shot on that Canon EOS 50E, 35 millimeter camera. And that lad who's walking in front of the shot, he was drunk. Uh, it was on the weekend. He must have come out one of the clubs and that was his, uh, he was walking home. I have no idea who he is. And when he was walking in front of the camera and that lightning shot came down, I thought he spoilt it. So I gave the, the negs over, the film over to my mate who did the developing for me. And I said, you know, give us a ring if it's any good. Uh, I'm not very hopeful. Uh, he said, well, it's a roll of 36 when he rung me up. And he said, and uh, there's only one photograph that's decent. He said, it's one of the best photographs he's ever seen. And there you go. So it was a bit of a surprise to me on that lightning shot. I was very, very surprised that it worked out. And uh, I, don't, I don't display it anywhere. And I should do, shouldn't I, really? So you've got to decide what's um, going off track here. You've got to decide what sort of camera that you're wanting to carry. You're wanting to carry a big DSLR, all the balloons and bunting and bells are looking like the best photographer on the planet, but producing uh, crap photographs. Or do you just want to try something small and cheap, maybe something off eBay, so you don't mind damaging it and it's just your, it's your learner. Uh, 6.4. I mean, I still use this now uh, when I go on jobs and whatnot. No. And, and and it doesn't. It do, this one doesn't shoot raw. Well, it it didn't shoot raw image. Don't panic at the moment. Um, but I've got a little bit of software on here which does allow it to to shoot raw, uh, a bit of a cheat. And uh, that's a good point to uh, to come on as regards raw or JPEG. Um, JPEG is one of the most commonly used file formats for photography. It's all down to the way that the file is saved and compressed, because you appreciate that uh, a photograph of a high resolution is a lot of information to store on a computer. So a JPEG image, in a kind of way, is a little package. Not only is it of the image, it also knows the information about how the photograph was taken, uh, aperture speed and things like that, and also its compression, its algorithm to compress it, but I don't want to go there with you at the moment. Uh, JPEG is a fantastic, fantastic format to use. If you're in the infancy of just taking photographs, I suggest just stick to JPEG. But if your camera actually will shoot raw, that's as good as negative. And the reason why it's as good as negative is because you can you can pull back certain aspects and gives you a better dynamic range. And what I mean by that is, uh, if you've taken a photograph and there's a lot of grey areas because you've pointed towards the light, or it's not very contrasty with a raw image on your photo ed editor, uh, you can actually change a hell of a lot more on, it's like retaking the photograph again in your editor uh, than what it would with JPEG. Uh, but if you're just starting off in photography, I really do just recommend that you, you, you start off with JPEG and then move on to, to raw when you're a bit more comfortable. Uh, it's a whole new world using raw. For me, you've seen the kit, that I can use, uh, some of it a little bit antiquated, not because I'm stubborn and tight, don't want to buy a new camera. We've got a new camera, um, but I don't use it. I prefer to use my, my old camera. It's part of me, it's history. It's like a dinner table for a family. Uh, you know, it's in many, many occasions, many, many events. If you had to push me and squeeze me to say, hey, go on, come on, name a camera. Well, I'm a Canon man. You can see that's a, um, a Canon camera, video camera. This is a Canon, that's a Canon. The other one's a Canon, you know. Uh, all the lenses are Canon apart from one, which is a Tamron lens. You know, I, I like Canon. Uh, I, the reason why I like Canon is because back in the day, and I think it's still similar today, uh, there's a lot more aftermarket lenses that you can buy for Canon than you can for any others. Sigma works really well with camera, Sigma lenses. In fact, some Sigma lenses are better than Canon lenses. So you need to have a look at what sort of uh, lenses that you'll need for your camera. Right, let's, let's name it. Right, okay, so if I was gonna point a camera in your direction, if you're gonna do video and you wanted a flip screen, Canon 700D, you can get them cheapest chips on eBay. Uh, if you're not so fussed about the video aspect, then I would suggest you go for the 600D. The difference is the 700 and the 70 are a little bit geared towards video more, especially as regards focusing, because focusing on these DSLRs are absolute pain. Quite often mine are, are out of focus. Uh, but 600 
is slower focusing as regards to video but fundamentally you just need to get to know the very basics you wouldn't jump into a, an expensive complicated vehicle as soon as you pass your test everyone buys themselves a little run around that's what you need to do buy a little run around camera a second hand run around camera a DSLR the one that you're happy with you can change lenses and you can just get out there and have fun in the future I will talk a little bit more about apertures speed ISO, a little bit more uh, technical side of things. Uh, I'll also showcase, I'll go out with the cameras and we'll, uh, we'll cover a few more areas about rail photography because I get asked, it's what you want. So yeah, I don't mind uh, teaching people, passing my knowledge down there. But whether it's the railways, whether it's astrophotography, Sir William Henry Fox Talbot, I think it was him that said, you don't have to go far to get a great photograph. And in and if I remember rightly, I think he was referring to your backyard. You can go in your backyard and you can photograph something beautiful. So you don't need to travel far in your car. Get yourself a budget, happy little snappy camera and just get out there and shoot. That's all you've got to do. Get hundreds of hours of photography under your belt and you will naturally progress. You will master the manual side of the camera. And when you start pulling out photographs, there are absolute bobby dazzlers. It gives you a buzz. And as with my photography, as you've probably gathered by now, on my website, nonovlogs.uk, I have hundreds of photographs there for free. I don't like to sell my photographs unless it's for commercial purposes. If it's for, per 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 if it's for personal purposes, you just want to keep a photograph as a screensaver, or you want to stick it up on your wall in your office or something like that, you can have it. It's fine. Because I think... Photography is similar to food. It's to be shared. It's to be given out. Why would your child draw a lovely picture of an Easter bunny or bonfire night and charge you to look at it? Now that's where the photography goes wrong.